Okay, good evening everyone. All right, good evening. I know, do the clapping. I'm the, I usually give, give everyone, yeah, a couple of. All right, welcome. Welcome to Science on Tap. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we're excited to have um, Susan Strom here for our September edition of Science on Tap. My name is Monica, and I'm a representative from the Women in Science Engineering at UCSC, where we put on, in collaboration with The Crate Place, a monthly pub talk um, where a local scientist or professor um, distills their research uh, to us all. Um, the peanut gallery, I guess. So, um, with, yeah, I, I won't say much, but yeah, tonight we have Susan, and she is a distinguished professor in uh, molecular cell and developmental biology at UCSC, and um, she has some pretty cool research. So, we're lucky to have her tonight, um, and with that, Thank you all again for coming out tonight. Thank you to The Crate Place for hosting this. And hopefully you get some food and drink orders in. Um, and enjoy the show. I'm going to try having this here so that I can use my other hands for other things. Can you hear me? I hear you. I'm, I'm holding it up. You can leave, you can leave All right. it, Susan. I'll, I'll, I'm turning it up as you Okay. Talk. Thank you for the invitation. This is really exciting. Not yet. More, more, more. This is really, oh, yeah. this is like a movie star singing, you know, lips into the mic. Um, it's really exciting to be here in this forum meeting with a lot of people from the community. And I've tried really hard to make, to organize a talk that will be accessible to even those of you who don't come from a serious science background, or even a no science background. Um, I'm going to tell you about my lab's studies of epigenetic inheritance. It's probably a term that many of you have heard of. You've read it in Newsweek, you've seen it on PBS and Nova, but you might not fully understand what it means. And I'd like to tell you about our studies uh, in a model organism, the nematode worm, to address epigenetic inheritance and sending information across generations from parents to descendants, to offspring. Now, we're all interested in whether this happens in humans. In other words, did my husband and I send, send epigenetic information to our children? Is their health and development being influenced by conditions that we as the parents experienced in addition to conditions that they're experiencing. Really fascinating um, possibility. So the roadmap for tonight is to talk about what is epigenetics and then does epigenetic regulation influence human health? What's the evidence it might? And then I'll take you into studies of epigenetics in the model system we use and tell you some of the approaches and lessons we've learned from our research. All right, what is epigenetics? Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Denise Barlow. Epigenetics is all the weird and wonderful things that cannot be explained by genetics. <laughs> and that doesn't tell you very much. And what's more informative, I think, is to contrast epigenetics to genetic regulation. So when we talk about genetics, and here what I'm showing you is DNA, double-stranded DNA. This is our genome, our genetic material wrapped around spools that help package the DNA into the nucleus so that it can fit in our cells. The DNA in each of our cells is about six feet long. So there's a big compaction challenge. The DNA has to be compacted, and it has to be compacted in a way where certain regions can be accessed to be expressed, and other regions get packaged in a silent state. 
So when we talk about genetic regulation, we're talking about regulation by the DNA code, the DNA sequence, A, T's, G's, and C's along here. When we talk about epigenetics, we're generally talking about how that DNA is packaged and how that packaging influences how the DNA is deployed, how it's used. So this is the type of regulation that, could, that is malleable, it's flexible over a lifetime. Conditions that we experience can change our epigenome. So I'll show you a little bit of evidence that epigenetics does influence humans. Some of the evidence comes from, this is sounding feedbacky. Is it okay? It's all right. Yes. Okay, it's okay. Some of the evidence comes from uh, analyzing twins as they age. Identical twins have the same DNA, so that should be a constant. Uh, and when they're younger, they tend to be identical in almost every respect. And in addition, their epigenetic code looks pretty similar. But they often age very differently. Identical twins do. And when the DNA, when the epigenetic, when epigenetic analysis is done of young twins versus old twins, it's been observed that young twins have similar DNA packaging, similar epigenetics, whereas older twins who have experienced different, had, life, had different life experiences, have different divergent DNA packaging. Um, I want to, so this is a work from Frog et al, and I want to thank Kiyomi Kaneshiro, who I think is in the audience, who came up with these great silhouette images for me to use. So this suggests that what uh, organisms experience through life, what humans experience through life, can shape their epigenetic information. Now, can <coughs> epigenetic information be passed from parents to offspring? And the model would go like this. As children grow and age, their life experiences and environment may alter their epigenetic packaging of DNA. And those alterations can be passed to the next generation via germ cells, the egg from mother, the sperm from father. When the egg and sperm unite, they make a new embryo, and that will be the next generation offspring. So the idea is that life experiences of the parents may influence the health and longevity of the offspring via sending epigenetic information through the germ cells. Now, does this happen in humans? A really wonderful study from Pembry et al. Um, it's exam uh, epidemiological studies of human populations, and this is actually from back in the early 1900s. He studied three generations of, ind of family members uh, in a little community in Overkalix, Sweden, where they have detailed records of both food availability, because he's looking at diet, and the health of the offspring. And what, what they observed when they looked at the records was that there was a, a link between boys' food supply, back in the early 1900s, and their grandson's longevity. And a link between girls' food supply and their granddaughter's longevity. Whoa, that's really fascinating in several respects. One respect is that this goes across two generations, grandparent to grandson, grandmother to granddaughter. And another fascinating aspect is the sex bias. In other words, the food supply of the grandfather affects his grandsons, the food supply of the grandmother affects her granddaughters. There are other aspects of this that we can come back to at the end. And if you'd like to see a really interesting uh, PBS special on this, it's called Ghost in Your Genes. It was produced, I think, in 2007, and you can, you can, you can find it on YouTube. PBS, it's a Nova show. So, we're back to this model, and indeed, historical records do suggest that what parents experience can influence the health and longevity of their, of their offspring. So this is what we'd really like to zero in on. We would like to understand the type of epigenetic information that gets passed through eggs and sperm to influence the offspring, all right? Now, we want to understand that in humans, but we don't do our studies in humans. Why wouldn't we do our studies in humans? Let's, let's, long generation time. What else? Ethics, what else? 
Pardon? We we lie. <laughs> we're 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 complicated. We're way too complicated. We have so many cells. We have a long generation time. We don't make many babies to analyze. So I bring up the question: Why study epigenetics in animal models? And it's because they get around all of those problems. So I'll show you the animal model that we study. It's the tiny nematode worm, one millimeter long, that lives in the dirt. And here it goes. So I've stopped this. I want to show you that the worm is transparent. We can see through it. We can see every cell. We can track the development of every cell, and we know the ancestry of every cell. These are the, these are the eggs lined up in the worm. These are the embryos. These are the babies that will grow up to be the baby worms. So there goes our worm. All right. So here's a little primer on the worm. It's called Cenorhabditis elegans. Um, some of the features that make it a really good model system, and I'd say there are what I call the Fab Five model organisms that a lot of investigators study. This is one of them. The features that people take advantage of are it's small, so we can keep lots of them in the lab. Uh, it's simple. It has all the major tissue types, but only 959, and we know the exact number, 959 somatic cells. Those are gut, nerve, muscle, all the non-reproductive cells. And then about 12,000 germ cells or reproductive cells. We know the lineage. We know all cell divisions from the embryo. And in the adult, we know the cell fates. We know where every cell came from. Uh, it's easy to culture, fast development, three to five days from the time a mother makes a baby until the baby grows up to be a mother. Wow. wow. Um, excellent genetics, so we can do experiments, and they make lots of babies, about 300 per worm. So when we do experiments to analyze offspring, we have lots of offspring to analyze. And importantly for us, um, Many genes and developmental pathways are conserved between humans and worms. What that means is that humans use the same pathways and genes that worms do. So what we learn in worms hopefully will be transferable in some form to humans and other organisms. All right. So let me start setting you up for the model that we're developing in worms. Our lab discovered that in worms there's passage of what I'm calling an epigenetic memory of germline from parents to offspring. So here's the mom worm, the dad worm. She makes eggs, he makes sperm. And what we found is that the, the germline tissue, that's the reproductive tissue that makes eggs and sperm, is in purple. And the behavior of genes that is typical of a germline, that information gets passed through the egg, passed through the sperm, into the embryo through cell division to instruct these two cells in the baby worm how to generate an adult germline. So we think there's a memory that's being passed from parent germ cells to the germ cells here to inform this worm how to grow a new germline. All right, so let's go back now to the epigenetic information model and let me tell you what we think the elements of this memory are. So here we are again. Epigenetics is regulation by how DNA is packaged and used. And we've identified two different marks that get put on the spools around which DNA is wrapped. And those marks are critical and they're very and they're instructive. Certain genes, so a gene might be might go from here, wrap around a spool, here wrap around another spool, here wrap around another spool and then be done. That might be the size of a gene. If a gene has an on mark on it, and I mean the spool that it's wrapped around has a particular chemical mark, then what that means is that that gene is on. What do I mean by on? It means that gene is being made into RNA and, the RNA and that's being made into protein. And protein is generally what carries out the functions in our cells. So this means that the gene is being expressed in order to carry out the, the function that it must carry out. Other genes are marked with off marks. 
you can see they're packaged up in this very condensed DNA. Those genes are not going to be expressed. So here, if gene Y is off, what it means is the gene is there. It's not gone, but it is not being made into RNA and protein. Okay? So we have on marks and we have off marks. Do the on marks and off marks matter? We've identified one of each. And they're sort of complementary in terms of where they are in the genome. Do they matter? Yes. And the evidence is this. So I'm, you have to hang on for a little bit of worm genetics. If mother is normal, she is sending the memory of germline into her embryos to the primordial germ cells. All of her progeny can make a germline and are fertile. But if the mother cannot make those on and off marks, either the on marks or the off marks, then she makes offspring, and they have primordial germ cells, but they didn't receive instructions from mother back up here about how to make a germline. And so those germ cells die. And she grows up, I mean, all of these progeny grow up to be sterile because they like germ cells. And what's remarkable about worms is we can see with our eyes if they're fertile or sterile. We look under the microscope, they're transparent. If they have embryos, they're fertile. If they don't have embryos, they're sterile. And we can see that. I cannot look at a room full of people and tell whether individuals are fertile or sterile. Right? You have to do matings. I mean, people have to do matings. But here, we can actually gauge that by the appearance of the worm, because we can see through them. So we've developed um, a model that there is passage of an epigenetic memory of germline from parents to offspring. And I want to summarize what we've learned so far. And then I want to tell you how we learned some of this and show you the nature of an experiment. So the Strom Lab's major advances. We've identified the epigenetic on and off marks used in this memory. For anyone out there who uh, studies chromatin and, and knows the nature of marks, the on mark is histone H3 methylated on lysine 36. And the off mark is histone H3 methylated on lysine 27. And from now on, they're on and off marks. Okay? We've also identified the writers. What I mean by that are the enzymes, the proteins that make those marks. So we have to have a writer that makes the on mark and a different writer that makes the off marks. We've tracked the passage of the on and off marks to offspring. So we've tracked them from mom and dad through the egg and sperm into the offspring. And we've tracked the passage of the on and off marks through cell divisions of the embryo to the primordial germ cells. So that's sort of a summary of some of the advances we've made. And now I want to address how. I want to give you a sense of how we did this. And I'm going to address these two questions. How do we track the passage of marks? All right. So we've, I've said we have on marks on this sort of open uh, DNA, and we have off marks on closed, compacted DNA. And in order to see them, there's nothing visible about those marks. I can't look in a microscope and see the on marks and off marks. But I can make them visible with two steps. So first of all, I use antibodies. Those are um, molecules in your blood that recognize foreign compounds. And you can buy antibodies from companies that recognize the off mark. Very handy. We don't have to make them. We just pay $200 and they send us antibodies <laughs> that recognize the off mark. So that's great. We've got a specific tag that's going to see the off marks. But the antibodies are still dark. There's nothing that we see about them. So the next step is to make the antibodies visible. So. Okay? We have to make the antibodies visible. And we do that by tagging them with a, green a fluorescent green molecule from, for instance, jellyfish or a, fluoro a fluorochrome that glows green or that glows red or that glows another color. But you can see, if we go into a dark microscope room, 
and we turn off the lights and everything's black, the only places that we'll see glowing green are those places that are bound by antibody and that have a glowing green tag attached to the antibody. And now I'm speaking into my <laughs> glow light. Okay? So, wow. regions of off marks along chromosomes will glow green. So this region would glow green. This region wouldn't. It doesn't have off marks. And then in the nucleus, regions that have off marks will glow green. Okay? You get the gist of the experiment? Any questions about what we're doing? Yes? So, at the beginning, you talked about how there were two people yes. who were, uh, had, an, had an open choice, right. and that this was reflected on the ground. Yes. Some thing that happened to them at the beginning that triggered yeah, this thing that you were looking for generationally. What is the thing that happened to these at the beginning that is yeah. the equivalent that created these, all these things being off, that's, that's, and that's why you're tracking it. Yes, so you, what, what set up the pattern of on and off marks in these organisms? Because earlier I, I set up the possibility, I'm doing that. So what is it that set up this pattern in worms, given that in humans, I'm saying the patterns can be altered by diet. So this pattern is what, what is part of their development. And so part of the developmental program early on is to parse the genome into regions that should be on and regions that should be off. And those will be appropriate for the different tissues. So in a liver cell, you're going to have liver genes on and you're going to have brain genes off. In a brain cell, you're going to have liver genes off and brain genes on. So each cell has to make its decision what regions of the genome it's going to package in an on state or an off state. It's really complicated, but cool. And I think we're getting a handle on how that happens and how it can be influenced by something like diet. But what was it in these C. elegans that, that created this, like you say, there's something that's wrong with it because the next generation is coming out sterile. Oh, so the way we're making the next generation sterile, that's the question is we, in the experiment I showed you, do the off and on marks matter? The evidence was we took away the enzyme that makes the off marks. We took away the writer. So there are no off marks in the genome. That's a bad situation for the worm. And all of the animals are sterile. Or we took away the writer that made the on marks, and all of the progeny worms are sterile. So that's the nature of the perturbation that we did in the parent. Thanks, that's a good clarification. Yeah. Okay, so we've got this situation and now I want to show you what this, what an image would look like. What are we looking at under the microscope? And this is looking at 12 chromosomes. Six are here, six are here. These six chromosomes have DNA that's stained red, but they lack the off marks, so there's no green on them. These six chromosomes have red stained DNA, but they have the off marks. So they have green staining on them, and when you do a combination of red and green, you get sort of a yellow. So we're seeing chromosomes that lack the off marks and chromosomes that have the off marks. So now we have the situation that allows us to address how marks are passed. And I'll show you two experiments. Do sperm pass off marks to the embryo? And by that I mean, do sperm have regions of the genome that are packaged with off marks? And do they pass that kind of packaging to the embryo? And one of the reasons we tackled sperm first is because in many organisms, sperm get rid of the kind of marking we're studying. So we wanted to make sure sperm in fact transferred the marking that we're studying. So we did this experiment. We, we, and we can genetically set this up. We have the mother that makes eggs that lack the off marks. We've knocked out the writers of the off marks. And we have um, fathers that can make the off marks, and so their sperm have the off marks in them. If the sperm can transfer chromosomes with the off marks, this is what we should see in the embryo. The six chromosomes from the sperm should glow green. The six chromosomes from the egg 
should not glow green because we set the mother up to be mutant. And that's exactly what we see. So this is the picture I just showed you. This is the egg chromosomes lacking the off mark. This is the sperm chromosomes containing the off mark. And so this established that sperm transfer epigenetically marked chromosomes into the embryo and maybe epigenetic information. And then we did the opposite experiment to address what the eggs send in. So I just set up this experiment. And now the opposite experiment is the egg chromosomes can have the off mark. The sperm chromosomes come up from a mutant father, which cannot make off marks. So those lack the green. And this is what we would see if the oocyte, the egg, passes off marks on her chromosomes into the embryo. So now, here are the egg chromosomes marked with the off mark. Here are the sperm chromosomes lacking the off mark. Okay? So we've achieved one hurdle. We've shown that each parent, the mother through her egg, the father through the sperm, can send epigenetic information in the form of histone marking into the one cell embryo. Now we have hurdle number two. Is that epigenetic information passed through cell divisions? You've gotten it into the embryo, the fusion of egg and sperm. But now the one cell embryo divides into two cells and four cells and eight cells and 16 cells. Is the information being transferred during each division? So I set, um, I just created this scenario before. Sperm chromosomes have the mark, egg chromosomes lack the mark. Here's the one cell embryo. Now, what happens before cell division is that these two groups of chromosomes, they all undergo one round of DNA replication and they all come together in a mishmash. I'm, I'm having a hard time gesticulating with my microphone. They come together as, as a mishmash in the middle of the embryo. And then um, a version of all of these goes to both daughter cells. So here's a two cell embryo. And that two cell embryo got six chromosomes from the sperm, six from the oocyte that cell. And that cell got six from the sperm, six from the egg. Sorry, I should use the word egg. So if that epigenetic marking is passed through cell division, we expect to see six out of the 12 chromosomes green here, six out of the 12 chromosomes green here. And that's exactly what we see. We now have a nucleus with 12 chromosomes. Six are marked with green six lack the green, okay? And remarkably, the off marks, these green off marks, we know stay confined to the chromosomes that came in with them. In other words, if the sperm chromosome came in with the off marks, these off marks after cell divisions stay on the sperm-derived chromosomes, okay? And this demonstrates memory. It says epigenetic marking is passed from parents into the embryo and through cell divisions. Okay? Um, so the significance of these findings, when I presented <laughs> these images at a chromatin and epigenetics meeting about three years ago, they were met with such excitement because so much of what we do in epigenetics and chromatin, and chromatin is the term for DNA wrapped around those spools. So much of the work is biochemical and not very visual. But our experiments were so visual. And it really provided, our findings in worms provided visual and compelling evidence that important epigenetic information, which we've defined through the genetics, can be transmitted from parents to offspring. Okay? So what are we doing now? It's not like we close the door and say, done, finish that. Um, we're now tackling, we're sort of digging deeper and trying to figure out what gene level epigenetic information is passed to the offspring via the egg and via the sperm. I've shown you whole chromosome staining. That's very, in the parlance of the lab, would be low resolution. We really are not seeing the details on the chromosomes. There are other methods for us to look up close and personal along the stretch of a chromosome and figure out which regions of the egg genome 
have off marks and which regions of the sperm genome have off marks and what do they look like in the early embryo. And I just spotted Tomoko Tabuchi and she's the one doing sperm. Um, how is that information, how is that information passed through cell divisions? We know it is passed through cell divisions, but the mechanism of that is there are models and we're trying to test the models. And then, big question, what are the consequences to these little cells, the primordial germ cells, of not inheriting an epigenetic memory? We know that cells die. They do a couple of divisions and die, but why do they die? We fully expect that they misexpress genes, that they didn't get the proper instructions from mom and dad. And so when it's their turn to turn on gene expression in a manner that's appropriate from ger for germ cells, they just didn't get the proper instructions. And if Chad is here, this is his project. So what are the implications for humans? Does this have any relevance to humans? The on and the off marks that we've defined Histone H3, methylated on lysine 27 and lysine 36. That's in all organisms, both of those, including humans. So the on and the off marks are used as on and off marks across animals. And so are the writers that make those marks, that we identified in worms, but that are well studied in, in humans and other systems. Um, furthermore, loss or overproduction of those writers in humans has uh, severe developmental consequences. It causes developmental defects and syndromes, and it contributes to many types of cancer, and I've listed three of them. What I showed at the beginning was that studies from over Calix and elsewhere have shown that nutrition and other conditions that parents experience, like smoking at a young age, can influence um, their offspring. The diet results said, have said that there is an impact on different, on heart disease, on obesity, and on diabetes. And we're really hoping that our studies of epigenetic memory in worms will inform how epigenetic memory might be transferred from grandfather to son to grandson uh, for the female versions. So I want to give a shout out to my awesome research team. Everybody here from my lab, can you stand up and wave? Tomoko, Andreas, Brayden, Tomoko. <laughs> Who am I missing? Brayden, Andreas, Yoni. These are the folks who do the work. I sit in my office <laughs> and uh, write papers and talk to them and talk to colleagues and work on the computer and write grants. And it's fun being the ringleader, but I'm not at the bench, and they're the ones really doing the work. So um, here's the group, and some of the work I talked about was from Kiyomi and Andreas and Tomoko. And Chad is working on the PGCs. I also want to thank my family for supporting this woman in science. That's us then. That's me now. Um, and I'll point out that I'm married to a husband in science, and I have a daughter in science, and guess where we're going? I have a son in science. <laughs> so uh, the, these apples did not fall far from these trees. I do not have a dog in science. <laughs> and finally, thanks to WISE for sponsoring these Science on Tap talks. This is my first one, but I will definitely be back. So I'm happy to continue, take questions and continue the discussion. Do you think chemicals in our environment are influencing um, the expression of these genes, you know, from your work? Thank you. Um, especially like endocrine disruptors and bioaccumulation. Do you think a plant-based diet helps to... Uh, prevent some of these effects? So the question is, do we in the field think that chemicals in the environment, toxins, um, endocrine disruptors, can have influences on this? And I'd say the answer is almost certainly yes. And it's being studied. There are a lot of investigators who are using especially mouse and rat models and exposing parents 
to something deleterious and then analyzing the offspring. And often the parent being exposed is the male parent because they're producing sperm continuously and because you're not, the studies are not confounded by the influence of, I mean, think about when an egg and a sperm are fertilized. The egg is huge and vast and the sperm is tiny. And the sperm really brings in a genome while the egg brings in a genome and a lot of supplies. And so you could be disrupting the supplies and not the genome in a female, and that would sort of complicate analysis. So there's a lot of emphasis on studying treatment of males, exposure of males to toxins and endocrine disruptors. So what about bioaccumulation? What about bioaccumulation? Do you think a plant-based diet is better right now? I mean, look at what's going on in the water contamination. Yeah. Yeah, so what about um, accumulation of these, uh, bioaccumulation, bio and is a plant-based diet better? I don't know. I mean, I'm not qualified to speak to that. I think it's a really interesting issue, and I'm certain there are people who are qualified and really want to study that. Yes? So aren't most of these endocrine disruptors being sprayed on plants, so you would expect them to be in those plants that you're eating rather than meats and well, things like that. Bioaccumulation I get as it goes up the food chain into you know fish and but so the point is most endocrine disruptors are being sprayed on plants. Right. And therefore plants might be a source of them, but animals would eat the plants. So it, it's often hard to dissect so where the exposure well, I think it's plastic a lot of it, isn't it? Like BPA and yeah, yeah. not so much BPA's been plants. yeah and then if the animal eats it yeah. accumulates in the flesh and animal products to huh. a greater, a greater concentration. Yeah. And Sounds like you know a lot. You should get, be up here giving a wise talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds questions. like you know a lot. Yeah. You should oh, be sorry. up here <laughs> <laughs> giving a wise talk. Um, yes? So, um, with a short generational time scale, if you have these off switches transmitted to the next generation, and then the sort of random whatever meeting from that point on, can you continue to track them all the way down, like it's 20 generations later and you're still seeing things show up that are different? Um, so, because we have such a short generation time in worms, can we track effects for many, many, many generations? It depends on what kinds of disruptions we do and what the effect is. In our system, when we knock out the writers of these marks, the effect is immediate. We knock out the writers in the mother. The mother herself is okay, but all of her offspring are sterile. There's nobody to track because they're not making babies. But there are other disruptions that are really interesting where you make the mother, you knock something out in the mother, and in her offspring, a few are sterile. And then in the offspring of them, more are sterile. We call it a mortal germline because they can become progressively sterile over many generations. So if you're looking at sterility, it's going up and up and up over time. And that allows you to see that, in fact, you can be accumulating damage over generations. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering what you would guess how this would be expressed in humans. Like, what types of things are we talking about? How do we be anything? Well, so... Can you repeat the question? Yeah. What how is this being expressed in humans? Or maybe, I mean, maybe I'll sort of phrase it a different way. Is the histone memory that we're studying in worms likely to be what's operating in humans, for instance? Right. And in what areas would it show? What, what types of things? What would be the phenotypes that would result from that? Right. Um, so I'm going to answer that question in two parts. One is that when we think about mediators of epigenetics, so something that regulates gene expression in cells and can be altered by the environment conditions, exposures to toxins. We generally think about three types of mediators, and I've told you about one. And this mediator is actual changes to the spools around which DNA is wrapped. Another mediator is actual chemical changes to the DNA. You methylate DNA and it alters gene expression. And finally, another mediator is load 
non-coding RNAs into the nucleus and they can help tell the genome which regions to express and which regions not to express. We do not know that this histone-based memory is what humans use to transmit information. Remember, when information is transmitted from parents to offspring, the conduit, the channel, is germ cells. Any information that's going to the offspring has to go through an egg from mom and a sperm from dad. So what's in the egg and the sperm? What's the nature of the information? How might it be altered in the parent so that the offspring experiences disease? Sometimes the effects can be beneficial. I don't mean to imply that it's always a, a negative effect. So I'm saying there are these three mechanisms that can influence the what I'm saying is the epigenome. And whether it's histone-based is uncertain, uh, in part because in humans, especially in sperm, they get rid of a lot of their histones for packaging. And they repackage their genome in, with a different protein called protamines. So it, it's an area that really interests us, and I go to meetings and we get into big debates about this, and it's wonderful to compare notes with others investigating this in rats and mice and Drosophila and zebrafish. Yeah? So is there any evidence from mammalian cloning that histone epigenetics is being transferred, or is, are the only studies methylation of DNA? in those cases. Uh, or is there any evidence from mammalian cloning? Like Dolly the sheep. Dolly the sheep. Uh, that's, that's a really great point. The, epige the epigenetic marking has to be okay for a clone to survive and grow up to term, um, often clones don't do well. So Dolly the sheep was a success story, but when you try to clone animals, the majority of them don't make it. Some do, and some of those get sick and die prematurely. There, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, some of that could be due to inappropriate epigenetic marking. I don't know. Let me think about that. It's a really good uh, issue to think about. Question, yeah. I yeah. I, the question is, could epigenetics be a driver of evolution? And I'd say the answer is yes. One of the aspects of epigenetics that is interesting is it's flexible and plastic. In other words, it can be responsive. And that can give an organism the ability to adapt to a new environment without having to change DNA sequence. Uh, and, and so that could lead to speciation, and yes, I think it can have profound effects on evolution. Yes? Yes. Yes. So, do you have places that you want to take this to look for stressors that you want to investigate or something? Say the last part. Do we have what? Like stressors or something that you want to investigate? Right. Do we have. Okay. So, we've been able to look at the histone based memory. Do we have stressors that we'd like to investigate? Yes. We have been experimenting with stressing the parent. We're trying to identify the right kind of acute stress. We want complete control. So that just the parent experiences the stress and then we can take the stress away. And the stress that we focus most on but we don't have results for, but maybe Andreas will analyze them soon, <laughs> is <laughs> exposure of worms to alcohol. We can, I mean that's I don't relevant. <laughs> um, we have, we can expose the worms acutely in the, as the adult generation is growing from baby worm to adult, then we take the alcohol away and we, we look at the offspring. So we're doing the experiment, and what we're looking at is whether there are changes in gene expression, whether those cause changes in marking, the on and off marks, that, that correspond with the gene expression, and whether the offspring have increased tolerance, increased susceptibility, increased sensitivity, whatever, to the, to the ethanol. And we could do that multi-generation. It's a really neat idea and we just aren't far enough along that path.
Yeah. Yeah. They're proteins. So what are the writers of the marks? Um, the protein complex that makes the off mark was discovered in fruit flies. It's called polycomb repressive complex two. It's in our system, it's made of three proteins that assemble into a three protein complex and that sits on the DNA, finds a histone tail and puts, a methyl, puts three methyl marks on a particular lysine. It's pretty amazing because they have to find the right region of the genome and then there are multiple histones to choose between and they have to pick histone H3 and then they have to look along the tail and put the methyl marks on the right amino acid. So that's the nature of what makes the off marks and then there's a different protein that makes the on marks. Yes. Yeah, so when you're cloning organisms and you get very different results, could that be explained by epigenetics? Yeah, it, it seems like a, a really viable hypothesis for that. Right. Questions. Jenny, and then. <laughs> so, this is uh, related to your uh, stressor comment, uh, giving the uh, word alcohol. Since we're here, probably consuming as much alcohol. I wanted to ask you, and this is the how does the stressor play in the broader environment? If you've ever had the experience with a journalist interpreting your research in a way that's worried about, so for example, you know. Right. <laughs> this is the sociologist in the audience. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, yeah, mother's care. We can't hear over here. Yeah. Can you hear the Jenny, come up to the microphone. Wait, give her the mic. <laughs> So this has to do with mothers taking care of their offspring by licking them. Um, what that? You're going. You're going to like this. Okay. All right. So my. <laughs> so my question to Susan was because she had mentioned that the worm she's giving them alcohol and um, as a stress term, we're all sitting here, many of you, drinking alcohol. So my question to her was whether or not she'd ever had journalists or anybody interpreting her in research in a way she worried about. For example, if it turns out that the worms were stressed by alcohol, maybe we'd be told, you know, maybe we shouldn't be coming to Science on Tap to listen to Susan. <laughs> um, and what I was saying is that the, there's actually a more like, you know, less funny but more actually real example of this and the example of the, the, the mothers, the rat mothers who lick or don't lick their, their offspring and how these environmental factors can influence the rats and that actually is being translated into um, arguing that how mothers raise their children can have long um, you know standing genetic um, effects which is you know putting new pressure on mothers who already have a lot of pressure on them so I just wanted you to respond to that really simple question <laughs> there you go. OMG um, Yes. <laughs> I, well, I'm a therapist, and I can say that the mothers always get blamed. <laughs> <laughs> She's a therapist, and the mother always gets blamed. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I mean, we have we have an amazing story. I, I can just I'll just paraphrase it because I know I'm taking this valuable time. Um, that Tomoko has done. We've we've tried to analyze whether what the sperm brings in because the sperm brings in a full complement of histones. And so we've analyzed, is what the sperm brings in necessary for germ cell development in the next generation? 
yes, it's necessary. <laughs> is what the sperm brings in sufficient for germ cell development? We can make worms that only inherit sperm chromosomes in the germ cells. They don't get any egg chromosomes. It's magic wow. genetics. And the germ cells are fine. And that says that what the sperm contributes is necessary and sufficient to drive germ cell development, which is really cool. Um, where did this come from? <laughs> I know. You should, I mean... It has never come up where we've been challenged about how our experiments affect, um, you know, adversely affect human behavior and advice. Um, it, it's generally the field of epigenetics is intensely interested in trying to do comparative experiments and trying to use animal models to understand humans when we can't do the experiments in humans. We can, we can of course, look at uh, counseling. We can, we can look at human behavior and track. Uh, there's one study about abused children and that they have an increased incidence of depression and psychotic effects. And they're wondering if that's an epigenetic effect. There are many, many publications like that. It's hard to know. Epigenetics is a great candidate. And we have not been targeted in a negative way by any journalists. In fact, if anything, the journalists have come after us excited about what a model organism can bring to the field. Yes? Okay, so in addition to DNA and, and epigenetic packaging, are there other things in the egg and sperm that the offspring inherit? Yes, so the mother fully loads her egg with all kinds of proteins. And some of the proteins are just housekeeping proteins that will help the embryo survive and make more DNA and do the basic functions. And others of the proteins are um, developmental instructions. And those can be really different from mother to mother and from egg to egg. The sperm contributes much less. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, but it contributes a few key factors like the little um, organizing centers that are used to segregate chromosomes during the first division and subsequent divisions. So fewer factors, but still critical factors. There's a lot more than DNA and, and epigenetic marking transmitted in the germ cells. Yeah. Right. Right. Is there a particular sensitive period when exposure to toxins or, or stressors matters? Uh, in nematodes, we can definitely do that. We haven't taken windows of exposure yet, but we can. And we can have it, I mean, their reproductive life, they're always growing their germline, but they don't yet have mature eggs and sperm until later on. So we can try to um, target those specific windows. In that study in Overcalyx that I showed you of Sweden in early 1900s, the sensitive period for exposure, for the sensitive period for whether grandfathers and grandmothers had uh, experienced famine or plenty of food was ages 8 to 12. So it really mattered. It was pre-puberty. And I think it was a little bit different for, for boys and girls, but it was in that window. Uh, and that was the sensitive period, and other periods did not render the same effect. So time of sen sensor exposure or stress is really important. So she says no more, but I'm happy to keep talking to people, so just come on up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Great. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to Susan for giving an excellent talk and for answering some really tough questions. And to you all for having really excellent questions. And I'm sure that, yeah, it sounds like she's willing to answer um, more questions and we'll be sticking around. We have to get her a crepe uh, to thank her for tonight. Um, so with that, again, I would like to thank you all. I'd like to thank the Crepe Place for hosting us um, and also to put in a plug for next month. Um, again, we do this every, usually every last Wednesday of the month. And so next month we'll be having um, Colby Anton, who's from the Environmental Studies Department at UCSC. And he's a wildlife biologist um, at uh, Yellowstone National Park. So we'll be studying a little bit uh, more more um, charismatic, but organisms just a little bit larger. Um, so please join us next month. Uh, let's give another round of applause for Susan, and have a great night.
Do the thank you slides count? This slide count. This one right here. 29. <laughs> I'm 
Ah, um pau, senhor. 